And at this point, I would like to introduce the Dean of the Graduate School, Dr. Willie Prado, to say a few welcoming remarks and to introduce today's judges. Good evening and welcome to everyone that's watching us this evening. I hope all of you are doing well, and we thank all of you for joining us at our fifth annual three-minute thesis competition. For those of you who have attended in the past, we know this is a slightly different format, but we are very confident that you will enjoy this event today as much as you have so in past years. For those of you that are joining us for the first time, we know that you will enjoy this event and you will be delighted to hear our very courageous students. I'd like to thank the Graduate Student Association for their partnership in putting this event together, as well as the wonderful staff of the Graduate School, including Laura Ramos and Tatiana Perino. And I'd also like to thank our partners and our courageous students. Without you, this would not be possible. Thank you so much for taking the time during this very difficult time to prepare for this three minute competition this year. And now I'd like to introduce our distinguished judges. First, Dr. Jeff Dirk, who's our Executive Vice Provost for Academic Affairs and our Provost. Thank you, Provost Dirk, he is a repeat judge. Second, is Professor Osamudia James, who is our Associate Professor for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at the Office of Faculty Affairs, and also a professor at the law school. Third, I'd like to introduce Dr. Maria Stampino, who's our Dean of Undergraduate Affairs and also a professor and senior associate dean at the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you so much to the judges. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Tatiana Perino. Hello everyone, it's so nice to have you here. The 3MT was started at the University of Queensland in Australia and since has taken off, many universities across the world are participating in 3MTs because it's such an important event. It is also one of our favorite events at the graduate school. I'd like to acknowledge the 10 graduate students who are gonna present their work here today. Their topics are timely and they're important. They're wonderfully diverse in terms of their background, their disciplines, and their areas of research, and their wonderful representatives of the University of Miami community. The task is not easy, and they've worked hard at this challenge, but they haven't gotten here alone. Their advisors and mentors, people in their departments and schools, their peers, their family and friends and loved ones have all been there with them, helping them get to this point. In addition, our good colleagues and friends across the university have been available to consult to them and to help them prepare. They include the University of Miami's Writing Center. They also include the Topol Career Center, the, top, the library's creative studio, and the library's data services team. On first look, this may look kind of like a game show, but a lot is going on under the surface. And this event touches on a lot of important graduate school aims. First of all, preparing for the 3MT builds really important and cross-cutting professional skills that are gonna serve these students really well across their careers. They include things like concise writing, compelling visualizations, and the ability to communicate well orally. It also is an opportunity to bring together our community. We don't have many opportunities to leave our departments, hallways, sometimes our offices, and what a great opportunity and reason to come together, but to support our graduate students. I encourage you all to connect after today's event because it's also an opportunity to start interdisciplinary conversations, which are so important. I'd like to go through the main rules of, of the event today. They're very important. First of all, each student is gonna have three minutes for their talk. They cannot go over the three minutes. If they do, they have to be disqualified. It would be heartbreaking to us, but we have to maintain the rule because of equity purposes. They're permitted a single PowerPoint slide. It must be a static PowerPoint slide with no video, no animation. In addition, no additional props are permitted, no costumes, no lab equipment, no musical instruments. Apparently this has happened in other events. Um, so these are the things we'll be looking at. 
you'll see a large timer on your screen, which will let you follow whether the participants are staying within the three minutes. I invite you all to take a look at today's program, which will show you the order of events. After the introduction, the students are gonna launch right into their talks. These take three minutes. In between the talks, you'll notice there's a timer of 90 seconds. This allows the judges to write down their comments and their scores. At the end, um, the, the audience is going to have an opportunity to select who they think should win. That becomes the audience choice award. And it's an important award that comes with monetary compensation. So be sure to write down the names and titles of the people you think should win so you can vote at the end. You'll also have an opportunity for Q&A with these amazing students. And we encourage you to take advantage of that as well. We'll tally the votes and announce the winners. The first prize is $750, second prize is $350, and the audience choice award is $350. One last note, we've done the 3M team many years, but this is our first year doing it online. And what we'd ask is just a little bit of patience in the event of technical difficulties. Our team has gone out of the, their way to make sure nothing goes wrong, but something can always go wrong. So don't worry, we'll be back on track as soon as possible. Thanks so much, I hope you enjoy. Okay, at, okay, this, at time, this time, the competition, the competition is going to get started. started. One note One is that in between each competitor, there's going to be a 90 second period where the judges are going to be able to mark down their scores for that competitor. And with that, we're gonna begin. Our first competitor is Nima Hosseinzadeh, a PhD student in civil engineering. The title of his dissertation is Saying Goodbye to Road Repairs. His advisor is Pinoy Surinini. Imagine yourself in the morning, you're driving your car to work and you already are not sure if you're gonna be making it on time or not. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in a road closure or a detour as a result of repairs and maintenance being done on the road ahead of you. It's really frustrating, we've all been there on a daily basis. A major part of our transportation infrastructure is made out of concrete as the base material. The concrete is mostly made out of crushed stone, Portland cement and fresh water. So just think about how much of natural resources are being wasted every time that we are repairing or replacing our roads. Based on a recent research, the total cost of lost productivity as a result of traffic congestion is about $87 billion here in the United States every year. And these damages and repairs are even much more happening in cold regions of the country. What if I told you for the last two years, here at University of Miami, I've been working on developing a concrete product which is highly durable, which is not going to be getting damaged anytime soon, and at the same time, environmentally friendly. So there are two main reasons attributed to these damages to our roads happening higher in cold regions of the country. The first one is a phenomenon called freeze-thaw cycles, which is a fancy name for the temperature variations which happen between day and night in cold regions of our country. So we have water inside the concrete, and when water freezes overnight, it expands by nine times of its original volume, resulting in internal pressure and in cracking of our concrete from inside. But this is not all. We also use de-icing salt to prevent water from freezing on the top surface of our concrete pavements. But while we succeed in this, we are damaging our concrete since this de-icing salt reacts with our concrete and forms an expansive chemical byproduct, which also leads into internal pressure, stresses, and cracking of our concrete at early ages. So here at University of Miami, we simulated those free salt cycles and the exposure to the icing salt. And we had two hypotheses to mitigate these damages. The first one was to replace a portion of our Portland cement with industrial byproduct like fly ash or slag to reduce that expansive chemical which forms when we use the icing salt. And the second hypothesis was to put some air bubbles inside our concrete with the goal that this is gonna work as pillows to mitigate those internal 
pressure and stresses. And the good news is, so far we've achieved multiple concrete products with durability six times higher than a normal concrete which we use in our roads. So just imagine if we implement this innovative concrete product in our transportation infrastructure, how much of time, money, and natural resources we are gonna be able to save every year in whole countrywide. Thank you for your attention. Our next competitor is Shannon Newberry, a master's student in architecture. The title of her thesis is Deflating Power Structures Through Inflatable Design. Her advisor is Joel Lemire. On June 4th, 2016, a rally was held in Dortmund, Germany called Day of German Future. It was organized by neo-Nazis who wanted to protest the influx of refugees in the country. In response to this rally, a group of residents met in secret and devised a comical plan. They proceeded to construct several reflective inflatable cubes that could be aggregated to form walls throughout the city. Due to their ability to deflate, the cubes were stealthily transported to public squares and deployed just in time for the arrival of over 500 neo-Nazis. Hoping to invoke fear, the extremists instead found themselves inconvenienced by a wave of shiny balloons. The barricades discouraged them from entering streets where refugees lived and their playful nature attracted the attention of the public. A joyful scene of curiosity unfolded as people began to interact with the cubes, tossing them to one another. Because of this one spatial disruption, the neo-Nazis were successfully overshadowed and deflated. Now, most people would be skeptical that a wall made of balloons would be effective, yet this quirky barricade effectively served its purpose as a playful deterrence. My thesis focuses on the strange yet important role that humor can play when it comes to problem solving and space making. My research has shown that anyone can use the power of architecture to enact necessary change by meeting three design criteria disarming with humor, creating ad hoc architectural spaces, and easily deployable with little capital. A sense of humor can encourage a flexible mindset. It embraces solutions that would otherwise be considered unorthodox. Inflatable architecture is inherently whimsical because it challenges accepted ideas of what buildings entail. They lack straight walls, they seemingly oppose the forces of physics, and they jiggle. They're just kind of funny. Additionally, their ability to pop up suddenly within any space contributes to their bizarre nature. Not only that, but traditional building types require capital and resources, limiting their production to the wealthy. Inflatable architecture, however, can be rapidly deployed with inexpensive material, making it accessible to more demographics while proposing an avenue of construction that requires minimal means for maximum ends. My thesis is both scholarship and activism. It catalogs the spatial and material techniques associated historically with this kind of inflatable intervention, but simultaneously seeks to distribute this knowledge through a user-friendly kit. I will be sending out dozens of these kits, which will include an illustrated guide, materials, and basic tools to a public that is eager to be heard. The aim is to empower a broad constituency, to see this idea of disruptive space making, and harness the power of humor and architecture to enable change. Thank you. The next competitor is Rosie Zhu, a PhD student in business. The title of her dissertation is Corporate Fake News on Social Media. Her advisor is Fabrizio Ferry. In January 2018, an online false rumor was started that a Starbucks employee was placing blood, dog feathers, and various contaminants into the drinks. And this fake news quickly spilled over to various social media platforms. And as a result, the Starbucks in question closed for a few hours earlier that day. As a PhD student at Manly Herbert Business School, I'm curious about how such fake news 
could affect our companies. For example, where does the corporate fake news start? Which firms are targeted? What is the impact of fake news on our stock markets? And most importantly, are there any solutions to fake news? So to answer these questions, I construct a thoroughly documented data set where I gather 315 corporate rumors that are identified as false by five independent fact-checking organizations. So using this data set, I find that more than 55% of the corporate fake news originates from social media. I also find that 8% of the S&P 500 companies are affected by fake news. And these companies are relatively larger, more profitable, and less socially responsible. So one of my most important findings is that corporate fake news has severe consequences on our stock markets. So in my sample, fake news wipes out almost $344 million in terms of market value on the day when the fake news first appears. And this negative impact lingers over in the following three months, and it accumulates to an over 3% loss in stock returns. Lastly, I find that corporate disclosures can serve as an effective solution to fake news. So I find that firms that respond directly to fake news successfully reduce the chance of future attacks by almost 19%. And those firms that take immediate action into spelling rumors limit the damage to their reputations. So this finding has an important message to our business leaders. So the managers need to detect and address the increasingly varied threats of fake news on social media before they escalate into more significant issues. Even for consumers and the retail investors like us, we need to be careful and we should pause and think before we share and trade out information from social media. Thank you. The next competitor is Mohamed Giasian, a PhD student in civil engineering. The title of his dissertation is Structural Morphogenesis of Green-Gray Coastal Infrastructure, Paradigms for Shoreline Protection. His advisor is Landolf Road Barbergos. What will be the first thing coming to your mind when you think of coral reefs, their diverse ecosystem, or colorful structures? Coral reefs are often referred as the rainforest of the sea. They form the amazing underwater structure that you can see them even from space. Just an example, the Australia Great Barrier Reef is about 2,000 miles long and several tens of miles wide. Like the rainforest, coral reefs are really biodiverse. It's unbelievable, but among all forms of life have ever found on our planet, more than 80% are found in coral reefs. I think just the beauty and extreme biodiversity would be enough for us to preserve these ecosystems. However, you should know that coral reefs provide ecosystem services with an estimated worth of $375 billion each year around the world, including food and fishing industries, recreation and tourism, and also pharmaceuticals. On the other hand, for engineers like myself, coral reefs have other great benefits too. They act like a green, natural, self-building and self-repairing breakwaters against storm surges and wave damages. A recent study has revealed that the annual coastal protection provided by coral reefs just in South Florida is about $700 million per year. However, they are not typically accounted for in coastal infrastructures as their effect is not easy to quantify. My PhD thesis is to evaluate the impacts of coral reefs on wave energy attenuation and coastal flooding reduction. So we can combine them with gray human-made structures. To this end, I've been doing some experimental study at the University of Maine with wind wave tank where artificial coral reef structures are being tested under different hydrodynamic conditions, from tropical storms up to hurricane category five. 
our, our results show that this artificial core reef model can dissipate wave energy up to 98%. However, this depends on the hydrodynamic condition and physical characteristics of the system. In the absence of design guideline for green gray infrastructure like artificial coral reefs, this experimental study can, bridge, can provide the opportunity to bridge the gap between engineering and ecological knowledge and pave the way for developing a sustainable green gray infrastructure. Thank you so much for your attention. The next competitor is Jennifer Ann Lane, a master's student in architecture. The title of her thesis is Architecture, Housing, and Racism. Her advisors are Glenda Fuente and Jermaine Barnes. In 1948, the United States signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which recognized adequate housing as part of the right to an adequate standard of living. However admirable this may sound, it is important to place that action within a larger social context. In 1865, a series of laws then referred to as the Black Codes were passed in the South. Such laws dictated where a Black person could work and live. That marked the beginning of Jim Crow segregation, which did not end until 1968 only 53 years ago. Again, in 1948, adequate housing was declared a human right in the United States. However, a human right for whom? From redlining to white flight, the implications of these racist practices have had a tremendously negative effect on Black Americans in the built environment. The reverberation of housing inequity for the Black community still persists today. Within just the last 10 years, several large banks such as Wells Fargo and Chase have had to pay millions of dollars to settle lending discrimination accusations. In addition, the National Association of Real Estate Brokers in their 2020 report on the set of housing in, in Black America said that there's considerable evidence that home values in predominantly Black neighborhoods tend to be lower than those in similarly situated neighborhoods with a lower minority concentration, and that housing appreciation declines significantly in neighborhoods where a mere 2% of the residents are Black. Now, it is fair to say that architecture and architects alone cannot solve this issue. Urban planning, urban design, real estate, economics, and more all have a role to play. However, utilizing a speculative approach, my design will interrogate the role of past and present housing policies in the Black community. Using Miami as my site of, of investigation, my starter home will combine issues of race, space, and identity to challenge architecture's agency in liberating the built environment from a history of racist and discriminatory policies. History has proven that simply the presence of Blackness can render a space less valuable and less desirable. How then does one create equitable and safe space for a Black person? With my design proposal, I will attempt to do just that. Thank you. The next competitor is Mary Beth Arcodia, a PhD student in atmospheric sciences. The title of her dissertation is Subseasonal Variability of Tropical Extropical Teleconnections. Her advisor is Ben Kirkman. If we could predict a flooding event one month in advance, how many lives could be spared with more time to prepare? Weather and climate predictions can now be made weeks to months in advance, thanks to an emerging understanding of how our climate system is interconnected. This is largely through atmospheric waves, which carry wind, temperature, or pressure signals that can change rainfall patterns sometimes a thousand miles away. My research focuses on waves that originate in the tropical Pacific region from two individual climate phenomena. The first is the Madden-Julian Oscillation, or MJO, and the second is the better known El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. They both have very large storms associated with them, which disrupt the atmosphere and cause rippling waves, like dropping a stone in a lake. These individually affect rainfall patterns in the United States a few weeks to a few months later. 
Now I wanted to understand how the MJO and ENSO work together to impact rainfall, pat rainfall patterns. On my slide, we see a massive cruise ship representing ENSO slowly making its way through a harbor, creating steady rolling waves. The MJO is then a speedboat passing through the wake of the cruise ship. Since the speedboat is traveling through already wavy water, it changes the wake that the speedboat produces. Similarly, the now modified MJO waves and the ENSO waves are traveling through the atmosphere at different speeds. Using a suite of climate models, I analyze how the wave signals interact. A significant finding of our research was that sometimes the waves become additive and amplify each other's signals, causing flooding or drought events in regions of the United States. A record-breaking occurrence of this was in December of 2015, when the MJO and ENSO conditions were primed to bring catastrophic flooding to the Mississippi River Basin region. Our study also found that other times the waves can weaken or cancel each other's signals. My research can ultimately help forecast extreme precipitation events in the United States weeks in advance, like the December 2015 floods, which translates to safer and more efficient evacuations, lowering of dam levels for threatening floods, and proper preparation of food banks and shelters. Knowing how Pacific conditions can affect U.S. rainfall can give management officials and individuals more time to prepare and evacuate, saving millions in infrastructure, in infrastructure damage and sparing countless lives. Thank you. The next competitor is Daisy Lopez, a PhD student in psychology. The title of her thesis is Family-Related Risk and Protective Factors for Suicidal Ideation in Individuals with Schizophrenia Spectrum Disorders. Her advisor is Amy Weissman de Mamani. Suicide directly contradicts our evolutionary goal of surviving. Yet, it's the 10th leading cause of death in the US. Even more surprising, compared to the general population, individuals with schizophrenia are at 12 times greater risk for suicide. Individuals with schizophrenia experience psychosis or a disconnectedness from reality. They may see or hear things that are not there, called hallucinations, or strongly believe things that are not true, called delusions. Despite not being grounded in reality, the fear and trauma experienced is not any less real. Unfortunately, there is no cure for schizophrenia and over 50% of individuals with the illness rely on family for housing and over 63% of them rely on them for financial support. Therefore, families and caregivers play a very important role in the well-being of these individuals. Imagine this. You were recently fired from your first real job and your parents begin to complain about your lack of contribution to the household. You feel guilty and like a burden and you begin to hear menacing voices in your head. You are useless, kill yourself. As your fear and paranoia increase, you begin to fear your parents are out to get you. You check under your bed, lock windows, separate from friends, and seclude yourself in your room. Unfortunately, your parents' criticism only intensifies. Get out of your room and look for a job, and for God's sakes, take a shower. You are a waste of space, just die. Although family may play an important role in the well-being of those with schizophrenia, most suicide risk research only focuses on the ill individual. Despite studies finding that caregiver criticism is tied to greater symptoms of schizophrenia. My study was the first to examine and find that as individuals with schizophrenia experience greater caregiver criticism, their suicidal thoughts increased. Additionally, studies have not investigated the relationship between family connectedness and suicidal thoughts in schizophrenia. My study found that greater family connectedness was associated with a reduction in depression, anxiety, and stress which in turn helped to decrease suicidal thoughts. 
My findings suggest that researchers and clinicians can impact the high rates of suicide in schizophrenia by shaping therapies in ways that not just focus on the ill individual, but help to directly and indirectly decrease family criticism and encourage family connectedness. Thank you. The next competitor is Kimberly Boswell, a PhD student in economics. The title of her dissertation is The Effect of Cannabis Dispensaries, Placement and Policy. Her advisor is Christopher Parmeter. Did you know that there are more dispensaries in Colorado than Starbucks and McDonald's combined? Since 2015, cannabis has become the fastest growing economy in the United States. Research has shown that cannabis can help fight pain, ease depression, combat cancer cells, in addition to contributing millions of dollars in tax revenue. At the genesis of cannabis legalization is California, the first state to legalize medical marijuana in the US. Interestingly, with the largest economy in the continental US, California only allows dispensaries in 85 of their 481 cities. Numerous protests and lawsuits have emerged from residents of surrounding communities claiming that these dispensaries increase crime and diminish property value. In 2017, the crime rationale was debunked. However, there is currently no evidence of the effect of dispensaries on property value. And this is the aim of my research. In order to examine this effect, I observed the willingness of a homeowner to locate close to a dispensary. This willingness is reflected through the property value. So by observing sale prices before and after a dispensary arrives, while controlling for certain characteristics such as the number of bedrooms and bathrooms, distance to parks and highways, and census tract demographics, I'm able to quantify this effect. My data spans from 2004 to 2020 in eight California counties, which contain 60% of all of California's dispensaries. Preliminary results show that with the exception of one county, Riverside, there is an up to 11.6% increase in the average property value for single family residential homes within a 0.2 mile radius of the grand opening of a dispensary. Used in tandem with findings in other states, such as Colorado, it seems like when dispensaries arrive, there is an increase in security presence and improved infrastructure within the neighborhood. At a time when the size of the illicit market is more than twice that of the legal market for cannabis in California, California lawmakers, by increasing the number of dispensaries, will be better able to control access to and use of cannabis. In addition, this will assist in reducing the size of the illegal market, standardize and improve the quality of the cannabis supply, while increasing government revenue through the collection of cannabis taxes. Thank you. The next competitor is Cho He Schrader, a PhD student in Prevention Science and Community Health. The title of her dissertation is The Influences of Spatial and Social Network Factors on PrEP-Related Disparities Among Latinx Men Who Have Sex with Men. Her advisor is Mariano Canamori. Do you ever wonder why you're friends with your friends? Well, according to the social network theory of homophily, you're friends with them because you share a similarity. Like the phrase, birds of a feather flock together, you are more likely to be attracted and befriend people who are similar to you in some way. Homophily is important to society, especially now. Think about those friends that you have COVID-related conversations with. How are they homophilous or similar to you? Unfortunately, this tendency for homophilous networks to have conversations within themselves means that minority networks are left out of the conversations of majority networks, 
We see this happening right now in Miami with pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. PrEP is a pill that can be taken every single day to prevent your acquisition of HIV. And although the FDA approved PrEP for HIV prevention nine years ago, there are still communities who cannot access this life-saving pill. One of these communities are Black and Latino gay men living here in Miami. Not only is Miami the epicenter of the U.S. HIV epidemic, but also the CDC estimates that 20% of Latino gay men and 50% of Black gay men will be diagnosed with HIV by the age of 50 if current trends persist. Well, my dissertation hopes to disrupt this trend. I identified how homophily is associated with PrEP-related conversations within the friendship networks of Latino gay men. I use a statistically advanced social network model for my analyses. Allow me to share two findings with you. First, homophily on cocaine use, meaning both friends use cocaine, is associated with PrEP conversations. This means that PrEP education can be incorporated into cocaine and drug use prevention programs. Second, homophily on race had the opposite effect of what we originally theorized. Latino gay men who are of the same race are less likely to tell their same race friends and encourage them to use PrEP. Why? Stigma. These friends may have networks which overlap and these overlapping networks may discourage them from talking about taboo topics like sex, HIV, and PrEP. The NIH funded my dissertation to understand how homophily creates connections and how these connections can disseminate life-saving information. Think again about your friends that you talk to about COVID with. These conversations, if constructive, could actually destigmatize the virus, the vaccine. And if the vaccine is destigmatized, then we can increase vaccine uptake in society and save hundreds of millions of lives. And as with COVID, HIV is here in our backyards. And my dissertation on homophily could perhaps be the missing key to unlock the strategy to finally end the HIV epidemic. Thank you very much for your time. The final competitor is Felicia Casanova, a PhD student in sociology. Her dissertation is Navigating Health Disparities and Immigration Status, Community Health Workers and Latinx Farm Workers in South Florida. Her advisors are John Murphy and Catherine Nawatney. I always tell my daughters that an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but do the folks that cultivate our fruits have access to doctors and healthcare? My dissertation argues that Latinx farm workers should uh, reap the fruits of their labor, not only in what they produce, but also in the form of a health healthcare access. In South Florida, Latinx farm workers experience unique health risks and barriers to healthcare that stem from economic and immigration policies. Community-based strategies like implementing community health worker or CHW models can reduce health disparities in vulnerable communities. CHWs are frontline workers that typically work in the communities they live in to help improve the community's access to healthcare. CHWs are linked to the principles of universal um, access to healthcare as a human right. In my dissertation, I investigate the experiences of Latinx farm workers in South Florida and the work of local CHWs. Through my community-based participatory mixed methods dissertation, I conducted focus groups, interviews, and surveys with CHWs and the community. My findings show how the community's understandings of health and illness are tied to their work identity and their immigration status. Fear of surveillance and feeling undeserving of healthcare were major themes that both the community and CHWs expressed. I found that lack of insurance, economic and housing insecurity, exploitative and harsh work conditions were other realities that exacerbated the barriers to healthcare. These barriers are mirror the institutional arrangements and exclusionary policies that filter into healthcare reform like the Affordable Care Act. CHWs also face constraints around their professionalization and tension with other healthcare personnel who may not understand their true value. However, the community 
continues to find ways to connect with CHWs through their social networks and community organizations. CHWs use their expansive social capital to bridge both um, services in health and uh, social welfare, like uptake, uh, treatment uptake, creating mobile health services, um, housing assistance, and the like. CHWs advocate, reconcile, and translate the community health needs while navigating the changing landscape of health policy and practices. Therefore, to improve health equity in the Latinx farm worker community, the work of CHWs must be supported and can be key in dismantling the oppressive bureaucratic practices in healthcare. Because in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, of all the forms of inequality in healthcare, healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Thank you. That concludes the competition portion of this event. I want to applaud all of our competitors on an absolutely phenomenal job that was incredibly impressive and you all should be so proud of yourselves. At this time, we are going to put the poll feature on in Zoom for everyone who's participating in today's event to vote for the People's Choice Award. And we'll give you about a minute or so to do so and then we'll move on to the next part of our program. Now at this time, I'm going to invite Dean Prado back, who's going to lead a Q&A session with all of the competitors. This will be followed by a short acknowledgement video, and then we will return to announce the winners. Congratulations to our competitors. You did a phenomenal job and we're very proud of you. And I know that you'll be coming on to the screen. So I'll wait for you all a minute for our Q&A session. Okay, great. So you're all on. So congratulations again. You all did a phenomenal job. I'm sure that your mentors are very proud of you and I'm sure they were cheering you on and I'm very proud of you all as well. You really do represent the best of the University of Miami. So now relax, the competition is over. No more heart palpitations. I kept on watching that, that timer and I, I was getting nervous for some of you when it was going down to four and three seconds. So you can now put those shoulders down. I will actually join you, loosen my tie a little bit and join you in a friendly Q and A session so that the audience can learn a little bit more about you. So I will ask um, each one of you a, a question. First, I'm gonna start with Daisy. So Daisy, what type of interdisciplinary work might strengthen the research in your thesis topic area and how? Um, well, I think that sociology would be a really great field to kind of work on this topic with because of their really kind of nuanced um, understanding of family systems. Um, so I think that that would really help bring to light some underlying mechanisms between kind of what contributes to caregivers and parents um, to kind of be critiquing or to kind of come together as a family unit. Fantastic, Daisy. I'm sure that you've met Felicia. Um, <laughs> there's Felicia waving. I think the two of you could collaborate very nicely. All right. So actually, I'm going to ask the same question of um, Chohi. Chohi, what type of interdisciplinary work might strengthen the research in your dissertation topic area and how? Sure. Hey, Dean Prado, and congrats again to everybody. This is great. Um, I just want to say that my research right now is pretty inter interdisciplinary. Um, I work with a mathematical sociologist, a public health expert, a psychologist, an MD, and a geographer, a health geographer. And so, I mean, it, obviously, there's always room for improvement. And to make it more interdisciplinary, I was thinking that perhaps somebody in communications could be a really good fit, or perhaps, you know, maybe somebody who's familiar with hurricane modeling. Information travels like the same way hurricanes travel. And it would be really interesting to see if I could mesh either communications and learning more about those theories or this new statistical analysis into my, my research. Fantastic. Thank you, Shohi. And you should look out for the Euling Fellowship Program. Um, which really aims to foster interdisciplinary work in all of you, really. 
and to have mentors across schools and colleges. So my next question is going to be for both Rosie and Kimberly. So both of your work um, is very tied to, to topics that are in the media, um, whether it be fake news or cannabis dispensers and um, other types of addiction. So for the two of you, I wonder how might your work inform some of this past year's most salient challenges? Um, I think uh, fake news has been a heated topic since 2016 presidential election. Um, I think that my study shows that fake news is not only limited to uh, politics, but also to the companies and the various stakeholders. So I think that my research should be uh, interest to regulators, business leaders, and especially investors, right? So this study uh, also intends to um, increase the investors' awareness of fake news when they are trading information from social media. Thank you, Rosie. And Kimberly. Yes, uh, similar to Rosie's answer in terms of informing the decisions of policymakers, as we see when the pandemic started, cannabis dispensaries were classified as essential services and were allowed to remain open throughout the duration of the pandemic. However, business owners, due to the status of cannabis right now, it is not fully legal in the United States. There are issues in terms of getting loans and other sorts of financial benefits that other businesses do enjoy. So I think my research in terms of looking at the effect of it on the industry will help in terms of diminishing that stigma that exists now uh, and sort of inform the decisions of policymakers who are now heading in a vote towards federal legalization of cannabis. So. Thank you, Kimberly. As a substance abuse researcher, I find this topic um, very interesting. Um, so my next question um, is for Mary Beth and, and Felicia. So like everyone else, you, the both of you have very important topics. And I'm wondering if you had additional time and not that we want you to extend your time at the university and spend another two or three years working on your dissertation. Um, but if you had additional time and or additional resources, how would you further an aspect of your research and what would you focus on next specifically? I can, I can start off. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Prado, and thank you to all the organizers of the 3MT and my fellow competitors. So I would like to extend my research to view it through a climate change lens. So my research right now is really focused on understanding how the climate system works and to then look at it through a climate change lens, I think it could help really with predictions for the long-term future. And so that's something that I'd like to go back and redo this analysis with that in mind. Excellent. Thank you, Mary Beth. And we have some wonderful predictions at our, our Rosenstiel School of Marine Atmospheric Sciences, who I'm sure you're collaborating with already. Um, Felicia, how about you? Yes, um, thank you, Dean Prado and everyone uh, for organizing this. So, I mean, that question I've thought of a lot and I have several alternatives, not that I'm gonna stay here forever as a student, but I do, you know, have a trajectory research agenda. And so one of the ways that I would expand my research if I had more time in grad school would be to um, investigate other occupational sectors that undocumented immigrants um, occupy in South Florida. Um, and then the other aspect of it would be to understand um, families of mixed mixed uh, status, who, who have mixed status, and, and to further, you know, interview and understand um, how they access and navigate, you know, their children who are documented, how they act, how they navigate the healthcare system. Um, a third way, sorry, I have another alternative to that as well, is um, I would um, study displacement, right? In South Florida, I would look at um, the growing displacement of traditional immigrant communities and how that impacts community health centers that are nested in that com in those communities. So that that's really where I want to take my research next. And so yes, that's what I would do. Those are the things. Some of the options. Fantastic, Felicia. I see a wonderful postdoctoral fellowship 
coming your way. Excellent. My next question is for um, Nima and Jennifer. So the two of you have said, again, such important topics um, looking at, um, at road, road repairs and, and, and um, housing and racism. And so, you know, I always wonder when I hear, you know, students present on, on their work, what motivated them to choose this particular topic? And how did you end up doing this type of work? So I wonder if the two of you can share that with the rest of us. Okay, you wanna go for it? Okay, so I'm gonna go first. Uh, the main motivation for me is, so as you mentioned, uh, my main goal in the thesis was to come up with the material that we can build our transportation infrastructure with that is not going to have any bumpy areas, any cracks, any traffic due to road repairs, which I'm pretty sure every single one of us, when we go out on a daily basis, we're experiencing like those repairs and traffic jams due to repairs happening. So the main goal is to just as the title of my presentation was to say goodbye to those because it's really irritating, it's really bothering. And apart from the natural resources that are being wasted, just imagine uh, maybe the, an ambulance wants to go from point A to point B and due to the traffic and all of the issues coming along with that, uh, lots of lives are gonna be lost. And this is just a tiny little bit of what motivated me apart from the personal experience that I've had uh, when I go and travel on road trips, even in the United States. And as we go up north towards Chicago, New York, uh, Colorado, like spots that we see lots of snowing and cold like, kind of winter seasons, that even escalates as we go over in those areas. So apart from the money that is being wasted every single year, the money that can can be spent on lots of more important matters than just repairing and uh, just building on what has already built once. Uh, so I'm just trying to avoid all of that, just find a way around it to just save the money and the natural resources and all of those stuff that come up with a more innovative material for our in transportation infrastructure systems. Thank you. Thank you so much. You so much. This is uh, very timely given that there's going to be such an emphasis on infrastructure um, with the current administration. Um, Jennifer, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I've what a couple of answers. The first is like the most basic one, which is I've always been interested in, in housing and designing spaces for underrepresented groups. Um, so that that was really the, the basis of, of the research topic. But then the other reason is that when it comes to architecture and racism, those two things aren't typically talked about in the in the same room, in the same space. Those are those tend to be um, separated. But then, as you can see, as I've mentioned as in with in the speech, a lot of it has is is so much more has such history, and it's so deeply rooted in the things that we're. Um, that we're designing and then the way the built environment is shaped today. So it forces me to, to get out of my comfort, comfort zones to, to have these discussions and it forces others to also be part of the discussion because it needs to happen. Fantastic, thank you, Jennifer. And I completely agree. And, and I'm glad you're stepping out of these walls because in fact, as you said, the built environment, having friends and colleagues at the School of Architecture, I know the important role that the built environment plays on, on health, both physical and, and well-being. So um, my last question um, goes to both Mohammed and Shannon. Um, you both have very unique um, dissertations and like everyone here on the call, um, on the Zoom, I'm sure that you all have encountered challenges and the two of you certainly are no exceptions. So I'm wondering if the two of you can tell the rest of us a little bit about what challenges did you encounter when researching your particular topic area? Uh, should I start first? Okay. Sure, go ahead, Mohammed. Hi, Dr. Brown. Thank you for your great question. Uh, I should add that uh, the big challenges, uh, I can divide into four sections. Uh, when you talk about the coastal protection or even more general marine environment, you should uh, notice that the the marine environment and whatever is related to it, to that is 
a dynamic uh, phenomenon so that you need to deal with it from different perspectives. When I first started working on this research, I was just looking forward to methods and uh, analysis that can uh, develop an idea that can satisfy the desired level of uh, expectation. But this is just the technical issue. There are other issues uh, that I just mentioned before, four issues that are existed. For the first one is of course the technical issue, but the second one is like legal permitting and also uh, whatever is limiting your uh, construction. So whenever you wanna build something in a coastal area, you need to pass a lot of rules because it's really sensitive issue. It's not comparable to the land infrastructures. The third one is the public awareness. For example, in Miami, no one wants to ruin the beautiful beach here. So if we wanna go and protect the shores with concrete sea walls, everyone will object about it, say that, okay, I wanna see the ocean. So this is not the right uh, decision. So we need to come up with an eco-friendly and efficient idea that can even satisfy people's beliefs. And the third one is also the economic. So we need to find a way that, of course, it is good in terms of performance, uh, let's say uh, permitting and people choice, but we need to quantify how much it will cost and how much maintenance it needs. So these are the four challenges that I think are uh, very important in my research. Thank you, Mohammed. Clearly both short-term and long-term challenges. Um, Shannon. Yep, that leaves me. So um, thank you all for organizing this event and I really enjoyed listening to everyone. It was really interesting. Um, yeah, I have definitely encountered challenges, um, which probably comes to no surprise to anyone. It's, it's analyzing like architecture through the lens of humor seems strange to you all. That's because it is. Um, and part of that is because like humor is incredibly subjective and it changes throughout time and is very different all over the world. But also as a serious like analysis through academia, it hasn't been taken as seriously um, until fairly recently. Um, and it's interesting too, because architecture is like the human embodiment or the physical embodiment of like culture and space. Um, and so like architecture really prides itself in being progressive and being a direct reflection of society. And because of that, we have a lot of like buildings that reflect like the human experience. So an obvious typology would be monuments. Um, you know, we built monuments to commemorate grief, to commemorate like victory. Um, and so it's just interesting to me to think about like how the human essence can be like created physically. And so part of that is like reflecting on the human experience and um, it's interesting to me just because like a universal language is humor and laughter. So like anywhere you go in the world, you may not understand the language, you may not understand what's happening, but if you hear laughter, you understand that like something humorous is happening. So I was always really fascinated by this idea of an architectural project that focuses solely on humor and how it's so important to our lives. But it's been a bit of an interesting process just because it's not necessarily an aspect of our life that we celebrate, mm -hmm. especially through the built environment. So yeah, it's been a bit of a challenge. Thank you, Shannon. And, and indeed very unique that you're bringing in these different disciplines into, into one. So congratulations again to all of you and thank you so much. And, and yes, bravo, kudos. I'm sure if we had a live audience um, on campus, everyone would be cheering you on. I, I should say we have our largest audience ever. So you present, you all presented, I can tell you now, to more than um, a couple hundred individuals watching via Zoom. Um, so with that said, um, now we're gonna have a short video and we're gonna thank um, not only you and our distinguished um, um, judges and, and other partners. And don't leave because right after the video, we're going to announce the winners. And I know that all of you at home are very eager to find out who our winners are. Although in my mind, as I said this earlier, you all are winners.
I'd like to thank all of you who are watching from wherever you are this incredible, friendly competition, what we call our three minute thesis. This is such a wonderful professional development opportunity for our students so that they can showcase their work to the broader university community. Our graduate students are doing such amazing work across a number of different fields and disciplines in trying to solve the world's most complex and interdisciplinary problems. I'm sure that all of you would agree that our students have done a phenomenal job and that no matter what the outcome of today's friendly competition is, they all deserve an incredible applause, not only for what we saw today, but for all of the work that they have done over the years that culminate in this short three-minute talk that we saw today. We have a large group of colleagues and friends to thank today for making the fifth annual UM3MT possible, and we're very fortunate for their partnership. First, we'd like to thank the competitors and their advisors. This group of graduate students have shown courage, hard work, and vision by recognizing the importance of this event in building their professional skills, their academic skills. It is a dedicated group working on bettering the world through their research. Moreover, advisors have invested significant effort in supporting these students as they've developed their thesis and dissertations. Their mentorship has been invaluable for many years, not just in preparation for the 3MT. We'd also, of course, like to thank our distinguished panel of judges. They represent diverse academic disciplines themselves and are all really strong and enthusiastic supporters of UM grad students. We continue with special thanks to our colleagues who have prepared students for this event. First of all, the University of Miami Writing Center. Under the leadership of April Mann and Joanna Johnson, they've been available to consult to students on their written presentations. Second is the University of Miami's Topple Career Center. Under Carly Smith and Ismaris Ocasio, they've provided students with feedback on their oral presentations. And finally, UM Libraries, in particular, Vanessa Rodriguez at Creative Studio, who's provided input and support on students regarding their slide and visualizations. Now and year round, these colleagues support all of our grad students in their academics, research, and career preparations. Each year, more UM schools and colleges decide to hold their own 3MT competitions, aiming to increase the number of students that are impacted by this professional development opportunity. We applaud their commitment. Despite the pandemic, this year, the following schools have led qualifying rounds. The School of Architecture, under Professor Joel Lemaire and Alan Shulman. The Miami Herbert Business School, under Professor Fabrizio Ferri and the College of Engineering, under the Engineering Graduate Student Association, Dr. Francisco de Casui Masalo and Professor Helena Solo Gabriel. Finally, I'd like to thank the entire graduate school team. This is no small event, and this talented and dedicated group continues to outdo themselves in preparing meaningful events while also supporting graduate students in every way they can. It is so nice to see. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you all for participating in today's event. And particularly, thank you to our competitors who did an amazing job preparing for today. And thank you as well to our esteemed judges. We couldn't do it without you. And now, let's see who our winners are. I'm curious, I'm sure so are you. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. The votes have been tallied and we have our winners. I'm gonna turn it over to Dean Prado to let us know who our winners are. Thank you, Tiffany. We are very excited to announce our winners. So we have two winners this evening. Um, our first place winner, and then our second place winner, which also happens to be the winner of the People's Choice Award. So first, the winner of our People's Choice Award and our runner-up is Shohi Schrader from the Department of Public Health Sciences at the Miller School of Medicine. Congratulations, Shohi. 
Thank you so much. And thank you for setting this up again. This is so awesome. And thank you for everyone who voted for me and who didn't. I appreciate everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much. And congratulations again. Wait, can I also thank my mentor quickly? You sure can. Thank you, Dr. Kanamori. You have really transformed my life in these past few years. And thank you for gritting it out with me about social network analyses, working on holidays and weekends just to make my education that much better. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. And now our first place winner is Mary Beth Arcodia from our Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Congratulations, Mary Beth. Thank you. I'm so flattered and honored. Thank you so much. They, I am really blown away and this was not in any way done alone. My friends and my family listened to me when they probably didn't even want to. And um, definitely my advisor has been instrumental in every step of the way. So thank you to all of you 3MT organizers and judges and my competitors for organizing all this. And I'm really, really humbled. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. And you and Shohi will be representing us um, in some of our regional and national three-minute thesis competitions, but more on that in the near future. Um, I should say that our first place winner, Mary Beth, will receive $750. And Shohi, as our runner-up and the People's Choice Award, will receive $700. Again, congratulations to the two of you and really to all 10 of our competitors. You all did a wonderful job and good luck as you finish your dissertations and in your next steps. Thank you so much to our distinguished judges and thank you so much to all of us who tuned, to all of you who tuned in. Have a great one, stay safe, bye-bye.